Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Carrie Alexander. Carrie Alexander joined Washington Hospital as a staff nurse in 2010. She received her BSN at Western Governors University in 2009 and is MedSurg board certified. Carrie is now a case manager for Washington Hospital. One of the things I love about being a nurse is I love teaching. And so when I got the opportunity to come here tonight to be able to share with you guys a little bit of knowledge that I have, um, I took advantage of it. Um, on here on the bottom it says Bing Bing Zhang. She's a wonderful nurse on my floor. And she presented and did all the research for this presentation. So um, she wasn't able to present it tonight. So I'm presenting for her. But all this knowledge, I, I studied it and kind of added some stuff. But all of this research, Bing Bing, um, I want to give credit to her. She's the one that um, researched it all. As I was watching you guys walk in, I got here pretty early, and it was just neat to see people in the community taking advantage of the programs here. That's what they're here for. They're free, like, like Vita said, to take advantage of it and learn. As you understand and learn more about um, diabetes, the better you can control it. And also, like this gentleman in the front row, his, he's here with his wife who has diabetes, and he said they have diabetes together. He's supporting her, so he's coming here to learn so he can help her also. So thanks for being here. And I'm going to get started here. I'm going to pr present um, some thoughts on and some um, education on gastroparesis. Have anybody in here just by a raise of hand heard of it before? Okay. So what is gastroparesis? Gastroparesis, it slows or stops the movement of food from the stomach to the duodenum. Up here on the screen you can see the stomach and you can see down here, the stomach contents are kind of stuck there, and the duodenum, which is the start into the small intestines. Um, gastroparesis is a disorder affecting people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, in which the stomach takes too long to empty its contents. And we'll study more about how that happens, okay? It produces symptoms of gastric retention in the absence of physical obstruction. So there's no obstruction there, but you have that retention and you have that bloation. And we know that's not a good feeling, right? A muscular organ located on the left side of the upper abdomen receives food from the esophagus. Can you guys see up there the esophagus? Through the lower esophageal, esophageal sphincter. It secretes acid and enzymes that digest food. And the muscles of the stomach contract periodically to break up the food and move it to the small intestines through the pyloric sphincter. Have you ever eaten something and you feel your stomach working in there and breaking it down? Have you? Yeah. Um, the contraction of the stomach muscles are controlled by the vagus nerve. And when the vagus nerve is damaged by illness or injury, then gastroparesis can occur. One of the most common gastrointestinal complications of diabetes mellitus is gastroparesis. The incidence of gastroparesis isn't very big. Look what it is up here. In a population with diabetes, is 5.2% over 10 years in type 1 and 1% in type 2 diabetes. But in general, there's a population of 0.2%. So it's not a very big population that has this. Delayed gastric emptying can be demonstrated in 27 to 65% of patients with type 1 diabetes and about 30% of patients with type 2 diabetes. So gast gastric emptying, delayed gastric emptying, isn't as severe as gastroparesis. It's a more um, minor case. The incidence of gastroparesis is higher in women than men. Um, I've been a nurse for six years, not a whole long time, but I, I can't remember having a patient of a guy 
with gastroparesis. All the ones I can remember have been women. So women, have your ears extra open tonight. <laughs> and causes of gastroparesis. Idiopathic. Most people diagnosed with it don't even know how it, what the cause of it is. That's what idiopathic is. You don't know the cause. And diabetes. The most common known cause of gastroparesis is diabetes. High levels of blood, sh of blood sugar over time can damage the vagus nerve. So we know that as if we don't control our blood sugar, yes, and your blood sugar is high, it does so much damage to the vital organs. It can damage that vagus nerve, which will affect the emptying of the stomach. So a really good reason to keep your sugars in line. Um, another cause of gastroparesis could be a nervous system disease, people with Parkinson's disease and multiple um, sclerosis. Also, gastrointestinal surgery involving any of the digestive organs can cause um, delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis. So what are some of the symptoms of gastroparesis? Number one on top, nausea. Nausea. Lots of nausea. It's not fun. Um, early satiety. So being full. Feeling full when you haven't had anything else to eat. Just that full feeling. Acid regurgitation. We know that's, that's not a good thing to deal with. Yes? Acid regurgitation. Stomach contents flow back into the esophagus because you have that food that's just stuck in the stomach that's not moving anywhere and that's going to regurgitate up and cause um, also esophagitis in the esophagus. Also vomiting of undigested food, sometimes several hour, hours after a meal. That could be a symptom of gastroparesis. Belotion, your stomach's bloated. Lack of appetite. Someone who's usually um, nauseated and is bloated usually doesn't have an appetite. And what happens when we're not eating? It affects our sugars, yes? As well as a lot of other problems. Also, a symptom of gastroparesis is worsening glycemic control due to a mismatch between insulin action and carbohydrate absorption. So, say like you've eaten a meal, yes, it's in your stomach, and you take your insulin because you're, you've eaten a meal, but then your, your insulin hasn't, your, um, the, the contents of your meal haven't digested, you haven't absorbed the nutrients, so then you become what? Hypoglycemic, hypoglycemia. Unexplained alterating hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia is a reason to get tested for um, gastroparesis, so you should make an a appointment with your doctor. The opposite for the hyperglycemia, all of a sudden your food goes into the intestines, it's been sitting there, and all of a sudden this food goes through, and then what happens? You're going to get the hyperglycemia. Does that make sense? How you get the hypo and hyperglycemia? So, a diagnosis of gastroparesis. Number one, you want a physical exam. A lot of times you can be tested and you'll find that you'll have gallbladder disease or pancreatitis, which is going to cause some gastrointestinal issues, which may not even be the gastroparesis. So it may be caused from gallbladder diseases and pancreatitis. I work on a surgical floor and I see a lot of the gallbladder diseases and the pancreatitis. Also, eating disorders. We're going to take a medical history of you because a lot of the eating disorders that people have present the same way as gastroparesis. So they're going to test your medical history. Blood tests. Blood tests are wonderful. Next month you're going to hear Dr. Begg tell you all about your blood tests. But when you get your, test, your blood tested, they can see what your sugar levels are. They can see what your electrolyte levels are. They can see, you know, if there's a lot of vomiting, there's going to be a lot of depletion of a lot of electrolytes. So these... Um, blood, these um, lab values all out of sync could be a way to help diagnose the gastroparesis. And also we have gastric emptying tests. So here's a couple of the tests that um, I'm going to just briefly go over. You're probably familiar with them. I bet you someone in here or a lot of you have had an um, endoscopy before. So uh, what, what they do with an endoscopy is they use an endoscope and it goes, it's a small flexible tube that goes down with the light to see the esophagus, the esophagus and the stomach and the duodenum. duodenum. When you have this test, you have to be NPO. NPO means nothing to eat. 
for eight hours because you're going to be sedated. And these tests can show blockages, tumors, or large bezoars. Anybody heard of what a bezoar is before? It's kind of interesting. I was looking that up. It says when food stays too long in the stomach, it can cause problems like bacterial overgrowth. So it's sitting there in the stomach and you have all this bacterial overgrowth because the food gets fermented. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Also, the food can harden into solid masses called bezoars. And those can cause nausea, vomiting, and also obstructions in the stomach. So doing these endoscopies, they can see if you have a bezoar or not. Um, and they can also see other problems such as ulcers, gastritis, and thrush. Biopsies taken during the procedure are evaluated to determine if there is any underlying cause to the z disease. So is there something that's going on to cause this to happen? So one of the common tests they're going to do is an upper GI endoscopy. Another one is an upper GI series. So what is that? That's an x-ray exam of the upper digestive Track. You're going to swallow some barium, and um, it's going to start from the mouth, and it's going to go all the way down to the intestines. So you don't eat you don't eat anything for eight hours, and then you ingest this barium, and then a series of images will be taken as the barium moves through the stomach and into the small bowel. And this test can find problems such as blockages, tumors, and the, in case of gastroparesis, what they're going to find is slow transit. Things are moving slow. And of course, ultrasound. The images can show whether the gallbladder disease, you have a gallbladder disease and, pre and pancreatitis. This could be the cause of a person's um, digestive problems rather than gastroparesis. So by doing that ultrasound, they can tell a lot of things. That also you have to be in PO for um, eight, six to eight hours. So it's good to take them early in the morning, right? So you don't eat at nighttime, and then you get those tests first thing in the morning. And obvious, if you're diabetic, diabetic, and you're, it affects your sugars, they can do some kind of medication or something for you for the um, sugar levels. Okay. So a gastric emptying test. That is um, nothing by na by mouth after midnight. So don't eat anything after midnight. And then with a diabetic patient, you'll receive different instructions about fasting before a test. Your doctor will give you some instructions on that. And most medications should be discontinued 48 to 72 hours before the test. Your doctor will inform you of all that information. And control your blood sugar levels. If your glucose level is greater than 200, it delays the gastric emptying in diabetic patients. So... Controlling those sh blood sugar levels are so, so important. I'm sure you hear that over and over and over again. And so I'm going to say it over and over and over again, too. <laughs> so problems of gastroparesis. We can probably think of uh, one of the major problems is severe dehydration due to persistent vomiting. So that is a very serious problem, de dehydration. And also you have to deal with the, the regurgitation of the food that's um, in the stomach that can lead to esophagitis, the irritation of the esophagus. And then the bezoars, like I mentioned earlier, which can cause nausea, vomiting, obstruction, or interfere with absorption of some of the medications. So those are another problem. Difficulty managing your blood glucose levels in people with diabetes. It's got to be difficulty managing your blood sugar when your food's not being emptied and you don't know when it is and all of a sudden it does empty and then all of a sudden your sugars go up. So it's very difficult to handle um, your blood sugars and you don't want your sugars to get high. So it's a, it's a hard thing. And then also a problem with gastroparesis is malnutrition due to poor absorption of nutrients in a low calorie intake. And I've seen different levels of gastroparesis where there, it's not that bad to where it's really, really bad. And so there's all different levels of um, of nutrition to give the patient at that time. And then decreased quality of life, work, missing work um, due to severe symptoms. So, you know, it's better to control it so you can have a better quality of life. That's why you're all here tonight, so you can learn how to control it, right? Or not get it. 
So management of gastroparesis. The goal of treatment includes controlling the underlying conditions that may be aggravating gastroparesis. And what could be one of the underlying problems that could be causing gastroparesis is high blood sugar, out of control blood sugar, affecting that vagus nerve, like I mentioned, which causes the um, stomach to not contract and move the food along. So, and control the symptoms. So if you are having gastroparesis, you do have it. The symptoms are pain, the symptoms are nausea, the symptoms are, you know, malnutrition. Um, the, a lot of times people say eat small, six small meals, little meals, instead of putting three big meals. So and controlling your diet, controlling your nutrition is a big part of it. Understanding it so you know what to do, right? And maintaining adequate nutrition, like I mentioned, and maintaining a usual routine. Everyone wants to have their usual routine, right? And so if you have, if this is out of control and you can't do the normal things, then it's difficult. For people with diabetes, regain control of blood glucose level. It's not easy, is it? It's not easy because all the good stuff, that's what I tell my patients, it's not easy. All the good stuff is bad, <laughs> right? So we got to watch it. Manage, not all the good stuff, but you know what I mean, a lot of the good stuff. Management of gastroparesis, diets and nutrition. So if you are seeing your doctor and you're having a problem with this, the doctor's probably going to have you um, see a dietitian, right? Or the doctor will, will, will consult you to eat less food at a time. Instead of, like I said, like I just got done telling you, instead of those three big meals, eat the smaller little meals. Does that make sense? Because if you're eating the littler meals, it could empty you better. And then um, instead of three large meals, eat slowly. That's another thing. Sit upright when you're eating. And after you're eating, it's good to take a walk. And it says don't go to, I read where it says don't even, don't even lay down or go to bed till like four hours after your last meal. So that's, that's really, really good things to remember, is the smaller um, meals, sitting upright, not laying down, walking, moving it along. I'm on a surgical floor. My floor is half surgi surgical and half neuro. And uh, we have a lot of patients who have GI surgeries. And one of the big, biggest problems after the surgery is getting the intestines to wake up, to get the, mobility going back. And what do we have them do? We have them walk, 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 and then walk some more, and then walk some more. So walking is good. They also have surgical interventions that are done if other things don't work. And we'll see, talk about that in a little bit. Pharmacological, phar, pharmacological um, therapies. Um, have you heard of Reglan before? Uh, a pill that speaks, helps the motility in the stomach? Also, um, medication that helps the nausea. That's a big part of gastroparesis, controlling the nausea. So medication that helps the nausea. And then with pain, you know, you have a lot of pain. You're bloated and you, you don't feel good. So if people want to take a pain pill, what happens with pain pills? You get constipation. It slows down the motility. So it's if you can manage the pain with an insect, like an ibuprofen or a leave, that's better than having to use the narcotic, which causes, I see that a lot, people who have so much pain and they use the pain pills and then it causes other problems. Yeah, but you don't want to have pain. So finding the right kind of medicine is real important. Communicating with your doctor and important. So diets, eating six small meals a day instead of three large ones, we already talked about that. Avoiding high fat. Because fat takes longer to digest. So you want your diets to be low in fat. Very, very important. Minimizing intakes of fibrous foods. It's another one that slows it down. Chewing food well. Because what happens is when you're, you're eating these meals, right, and you have gastroparesis, your food can't break, your, the systems in your digestive system aren't breaking the food down. So people who have real severe gastroparesis are on what kind of diets usually 
liquid diets or soft diets. So um, chewing your food really, really well, doing the work in your mouth <laughs> before you swallow it. And drinking non-carbonated liquids with a meal. Prescribing a liquid or pureed diet when a person has severe symptoms. I know I'm kind of repeating myself, but it's always good to hear things over and over again, right? Avoiding alcohol and tobacco smoking. That's a big thing, too. Walking or sitting for two hours after, oh, this says two hours after a meal instead of lying down. But what happens when you eat a nice big meal? You get sleepy. And you want to lay down, right? So maybe those little smaller meals won't make us so sleepy. But taking it, it's just a good habit, especially if you're a diabetic, to get in the habit of exercising. And after you eat, it's just a good time to get up and take your walk and help that system move. Nutrition. So people with severe um, gastroparesis have to go to a different level of nutrition. Um, intravenous total parenteral nutrition, calories and nutrients. It can go down through your NG tube, through the nose. Have you any of you ever had an NG tube? I haven't, but I don't ever want to have one. It just looks so painful. Going down through the, you know, down through the nose, past the stomach, into the jejunum, so right into the um, intestine. You, you pass the stomach, so the food's going to go right through. That's if you're really having some malnutrition issues, yes, and you really have to, and you can't keep the food down, and you can't get it through. So that's there's ways to get. Nutrition. Here's the pharmacological therapies. Stimulating the stomach muscle contractions. That's what I talked about when I mentioned if anyone here has heard of Reglan. That's going to stimulate the um, stomach contractions. It's the only medication approved by the FDA for treatment of gastroparesis. I was reading all these other medications, but none of them are FDA approved. Reglan is the only medication approved by the FDA. And the good thing about that is there's a pill form and there's an IV form. So if you can't, if you're in the hospital and you can't swallow, we can give it to you IV. Another interesting one that I didn't know was erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. So a lower dose of erythromycin will help with the gastric emptying. A lower dose of the medicine. Interesting to me. I didn't know that. And then another, another medication that you're going to take if you have it is something to help reduce your, your nausea and vomiting. And that's regulin, and we also have Zofran. Those are probably medicines you've heard about before if you've suffered with nausea. They work really good. Each medication has specific risks and side effects, of course. Your doctor can tell you more about any medication that is prescribed for you. So important. something that I always like to tell my patients is, don't ever say, I take the green pill or the red pill or the blue pill. Know what the pill is and know why you're taking it, what, what its use is. I just, no, don't just say I take the red pill, right, or the pink pill or the white pill. Sur surgical interventions, the jujostomy. There's a gastric electric stimulator. That's for people who are really bad, have it really bad. That's going to stimulate the stomach to, to do the work. I'm not even going to go over the other ones because we don't work with those ones. So. In people with diabetes, the problem is back to difficult to control blood glucose levels because the gastric emptying with gastroparesis, those are big words, is unpredictable. Makes sense, right? That's the hard part. Primary treatment goals to improve gastric emptying is regain what? Control of your blood sugar. I can say that over and over and over again. The best way to achieve the goal is by diet counseling by a registered dietitian to maximize nutritional benefits. We have some really good um, dietitians here at Washington Hospital. Diet changes to control the symptoms of gastroparesis. So sometimes we have to, like I said, watch the fat foods and watch the fibrous foods. Consult an endocrinologist for specific instructions for taking insulin based on the individual's needs and the severity of gastroparesis. And you guys in here probably all have your own um, endocrinologist, I'm sure. Take insulin after meals instead of before. Of course, this would be told to you by your doctor. But that's another way to control um, 
your blood sugar. Check your blood, blood glucose levels frequently after eating and administer insulin when necessary. So checking your blood sugar frequently. Is that something you guys do regularly is check your blood sugar? My father-in-law has been a diabetic. He's 84 and he's been a diabetic just for a couple years. And he will be out somewhere and all of a sudden he'll have to go. What, well, why do you have to go? Because it's time. i got to go check my... I don't know if he's using an excuse to leave. <laughs> it is a good excuse to leave if you want to leave places. I have to go check my blood sugar. You carry it with you. That's very easy to take with you. And you can. So I guess sometimes he forgets. Or maybe it's just his excuse. <laughs> but checking your blood glucose levels frequently is very important. So take-home message. Gastroparesis is also called, what, delayed gastric emptying, and it occurs when the stomach takes longer than normal to empty a food. So isn't that interesting? I didn't really know that until I was really studying this, that because of the high blood sugar, it affects the vagus nerve, which controls the digestion system. So keeping the sugars high and not controlling that affects so much of our vital organs that we don't even know until you have an issue, right? The delayed emptying can cause nausea, vomiting, and other symptoms. We've gone over that. The gastric emptying with gastroparesis causes blood glucose to fluctuate unpredictably and difficult to manage. So if you have blood sugars that's going up and down and crazy, it's a good thing to get tested for. Treatment is based on the individual's needs and the severity of gastroparesis. So there's all different levels, there's all different treatments. The goals are to improve gastric emptying, relieve symptoms, and regain control of what? Blood glucose levels in people with diabetes. For many people, gastroparesis is a lifelong condition. Sometimes when you have, like I mentioned, the pancreatitis and the um, gallstones, something like that, you have some gastric emptying issues that's reversible because once that problem is taken care of, then it takes a little while, but then you go back to normal. Sometimes because of high blood sugar levels not being out of control, the damage being too much is irreversible, so you have to deal with the symptoms. And it's not, as we've seen, the symptoms aren't very fun. So like you're here tonight, gaining the knowledge to learn about it so you don't have the issues is kudos to all of you for being here for um, being educated. And these are the references here. That went kind of fast, didn't it? <laughs> but any, that's, that is basically the um, presentation. So thank you.